So what we're talking about this time is uh, the science of making good presentations. So we understood the last time the problem of the science of bad presentations, and this time hopefully is the answer to that. So I'll just summarize a few of the points that I made in the last lecture and turn off my telephone with someone trying to see if I'm coming online. Um, the first thing is to say that what we have to accept is that it is not our fault in the past that presentations did not work, either as a presenter or as an audience member, but the fault of science. And the fact that we don't understand the science is neither an excuse nor a reason not to change. I don't understand anesthesia. I'm grateful for all your work in that and helping me with my patients. I don't understand it, but I know when it works and I know when it doesn't work. And I think a really important place for us to start is actually the fact that most of us, if questioned, would know what we like to see in presentations in a performance improvement approach. And actually what those are often a sign of is our understanding of where the problems lie and how to make things better. So it's not important that we need to quote references to move on, but to understand that what we are struggling with in the bad presentations is actually because it goes against our understandings, our ways that we want to work forward. Now, there's a little bit of a challenge in that because we keep doing things so often that we sometimes are inured to doing it that way. But there's a really good paper by a chap called Coslin who investigated whether people understood were there problems with PowerPoint. Yes, they did, but they were not easily able to identify them. So, the way that I think it's best to manage presentations is in separating them into their three component parts. The first part is your presentation, the message that you want to give to your audience. And the evidence shows us that we do not retain information as a constant flow of information. The second part of our presentation is the supportive media. And a lot of our supportive media actively inhibits our learning. And the third part of a presentation is the delivery of that. And we've seen in the past, there are lots of things that we do or see done that cause significant problems with that delivery and therefore impair our presentations. So what I would like to challenge you all to do for a good minute of time is to write down how you would like to see presentations improve in terms of one, message, two, supportive media, and three, the delivery of that. And if I cover up my screen, that will actually show you that I do mean it seriously, that you now have to think on your own about what's going on. So one minute about how we would like to see presentations improve, firstly, in terms of message, secondly, in terms of media, and thirdly, in terms of support.
Okay. Now, does anyone, uh, I've got the list of, of participants here. One way of improving um, presentations is to be interactive. Ja. So I, I can see... Now, another way is to try and interrupt people who haven't got their microphones on mute. But <laughs> what I'm going to do is I can see lots of names. So what I'm going to do is to come to different people. Please forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong because I'm not an expert. Correct me on that. Take your time to open the microphone. And if you want your video, but you don't have to, and answer a question. So I'll start with my friend Per Christian because I know that uh, he will have an answer. And then I'll come to Marlin after that. Per Christian, how do you think we could improve online presentations in terms of the message? Um, shorter, more pointed. Yep. Okay, great. Marlin, how could we improve online presentations in terms of the message? After Marlon, I'll go to Jose Gabriel, if either of you want to open up. So Marlin, the, Marlin says in this chat, I can't speak. I'm in a joint office. Okay, right. So uh, in the chat, Marlon, what, what do you think we could do? Uh, type it into the chat for me, and then I'll, I'll go to Jose Gabriel next, or Gabriel next. So is it Jose or Jose? It depends if we're Spanish or Portuguese. And I can't tell from just looking at the name, made Jose run away. I'm Chile. I'm sorry. It's Jose. Jose. What do you think, Jose? How can we improve the message? Uh, actually, I would like to answer that backwards by, okay. being, to, by preparing. Yeah, yeah. By preparing the message. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking beforehand. Okay, and that's a very, very important point to make. Did we get anything from Marlon there? Nothing that I can see. I think that's a really valuable thing. But if you look at what you've got written down, I'm hoping you can see that it's something around uh, having a succinct and obvious message. And maybe that's that second point about preparing. Because often what we have done in the past is simply have a ton of information and a desire to deliver all of that information. And what we shared the last time is that if that is not possible to retain, what we need to focus on is three key facts that can be remembered. Now, that doesn't just mean you give people three facts and leave, and you can give lots of supportive information. But what is important is to structure your message so that the audience can know what your message is, to remember it, and then to support that key message, usually with three key facts. So my three key facts in this presentation are about the three facts that we're going to improve in our presentations. The first one, my summary of that, is to stop delivering the what of a ton of data, but deliver the so what of a message. Now, uh, Benedict, are you out there? My question about the audience is how should we consider a presentation differently for a different audience? Benedict, are you happy to answer that? Um, Benedict. What yes, is the Benedict. Uh, Benedict, thank you. Um, I would, uh, it, it'll, it, it would be different from if it's, uh, nurses or medical students or yeah. or uh, specialists i would vary it uh, in the good uh, complexity or di uh, difficulty okay so i need to know my audience and isn't it amazing how many of us get an invitation please come and talk to this person and we don't really know where the audience are and even just the concept of say medical students 
there's a really important part that many people miss out is knowing what is the purpose of speaking to those medical students. If the medical students have come to your meeting just because they're interested, it's not part of their syllabus, it's entirely different than if they have an exam on your message the day afterwards. And so what we need to do is consider our audience, like the audience we can see in the screen. I hope everyone can see my screen. And also recognize that the gentleman on the far right, although he may seem the most mature or oldest of the group, he Ross, may... Ross? Hello. We can, we can see only... A, I can see only a thumbnail. Ah, okay. You do, you do not right. share it properly. Good. So thank you. That's very helpful. And often it's interesting when we have the concept of what we're doing. It's not necessarily the thing that people can see. Uh, let me try desktop two. Um, I will share that. Thank you for whoever it was that pointed that out. And if I then press this, is that better? Much better. Yes. Thank you. So you have to ask, why did nobody say that? And it's because of hierarchies and so on. And we think the presenters are right. So I hope you're seeing that. So my point about the gentleman on the right hand side is although he may be the oldest, he's not necessarily got the most information about your topic. And it may be a young woman who's already done a PhD and we don't recognize the difference between age and experience. And we have to start our presentations with our audience and also consider the empty seat in the audience. Why is that person not there? and recognize that it may be because they're busy, it may be because they have better things to do, it may be because they've had a bad experience of presentations in the past and made them recognize there's little point in turning up. But what we need to do is understand our audience and their purpose in being there. Now, I uh, used this point of discussion about the difference between aims and objectives. And what I'd like you to do is to write down what was the aim of the last talk that you gave? What was the aim of the last talk that you gave? Now, the second question is, what was the objective of that talk? And I'm hoping, I'm not sure with Jose, maybe I've discovered this problem once, that aims and objectives in Spanish are the same thing. But in English, the language I am so grateful you're all listening to me in, they are different words with different meanings. And a lot of people have this quasi-educational approach that they believe that we write aims and objectives of this talk at, as one of the introductory slides. The aim and objective are different or should be for our talk. So I'll just give you a little bit more time. What was the objective of the talk that you gave or the presentation? What was the aim and what was the objective? This image that I have with me to illustrate my point is that Maria, is the, vi måste hjälpa sig att ösa över lite äpplen från den ena till den andra. De tömmer den, den ena imorgon. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. This is the Reichstag building, building in Berlin. The aim of the artist, Christo, was to cover the Reichstag. The aim of your talk on... Uh, rapid sequence induction was to give information about rapid sequence induction. The objective of these artists was to have their audience consider what it means for the Reichstag to be covered. The objective of a lecture presentation on rapid sequence induction, firstly, the aim was to share the information. The objective depends on what the audience are going to do with that information. Are they going to pass an exam? Are they going to go into the field and deliver rapid sequence induction when they leave 
your lecture, because that changes the nature of the presentation message that we should deliver. Our aim was to cover the Reichstag. The objective was to have the audience consider what has happened. And if you like, the lens of the presentation focuses on the massive subject matter, but allows us to focus not on teaching, but on learning. Now, I'll say that again slowly. I appreciate hugely being able to lecture only in English, but sometimes it can take some time to understand. The purpose of sharing information is not broadcast, but receiving. And if we consider our message in that way, I do find that people change how they lecture. It's not simply about the information, but what you want the audience to do with that information. And that's the difference between teaching and learning. This is an image of, I suggest, one of the saddest graves in the world. Ignaz Semmelweis, the father of modern infection control, discovered the reason that his patients and their babies were dying in his obstetric unit. And the reason that this grave is so sad is that he merely battered people with data. And what we have to recognize in a presentation is that it's not simply about data, but about persuasion. We have to convince people that this is important because simply sharing information as a fact is not enough. And often, if you consider changing your presentation style, people will come up against obstruction, resistance, reasons why not to do that. And a way to persuade them is to understand the concepts of rhetoric, or at least why they might be in a position of resistance and change their mind by meeting what I suggest are the three main obstacles. So we have to remember to understand who the audience are, their purpose in being there, what are aim is in sharing information and what we want them to do with that information and then persuade them. That is so different from simply reading out a list of facts. And the summary of the rationale for doing this is this slide here, Bloom's Taxonomy, which talks us through the difference between what we understand of teaching as simply the transfer of knowledge, but learning, which is the progression through these steps of higher order thinking. That is obviously based with knowledge, but on top of that, leading our audience through understanding, analysis, evaluation, and ultimately creation of new knowledge by understanding who they are, their reasons for being there, how they're going to learn, and by persuasion, which is a simplification of a complex process I appreciate, but that's how I summarize it as changing the what of data transfer to the so what for the individual audience. Now, this is a good point to stop the share and ask for any questions about that. I'm hoping you're all still out there. Ross, it's PK. Yes. <clears throat> PK is down. Um, in, in, in Norwegian, we don't have that uh, kind of uh, uh, distinction between aim and a job objective. And I, I, I realize I need to, to look it up because it pops up everywhere. And as you said, I would normally treat them as one. Okay, so that's very helpful. Thank you. Did, did the explanation work for you, Per Christian? Yeah, I think so. I had to chew and think. That's good. That's how a presentation should be. Thank you, Eve. This idea, I, th I like that image that the aim was to cover the Reichstag, 
which in itself is a huge and immeasurable task. The objective is what you want the audience to do with your information. So aim is from one side, objective is the other. And I can see how the two come close together, but they are not the same thing and should not be treated as the same aim. The aim is what I want to transfer. The objective is what I want the audience to do with that information. And it's a useful way to consider what's going on if your audience are going to sit an exam in the topic today, or you want them to deliver cardiopulmonary resuscitation at the end of your talk, and so you're determining how to do chest compressions. Good, thank you for that comment. Are there other questions about this delivery, not of the what, but of the so what? I was thinking about how do we find out about our uh, lear or, I mean, learners or uh, listeners? How do we find out what they're, I mean, if we have a class, if we have medical students, we probably know that they're going to uh, for an exam or something. But yeah. if we enter a Congress and have a speech there, we'll have a number of people with different objectives. How, how can we... It's a very good question because the, the idea that we could have three aims that will speak to the experienced, the inexperienced and everyone in the middle is actually very challenging. But one of the ways I coach people to improve that is rather than thinking you're delivering a data download, you can ask the audience to consider their opinion or their restriction to your message. So that if I say, I should, I suggest you change your presentation skills, I'm expecting Per Christian has a different view than say Joanna and Gunnar. I don't know what they are, but I can ask them to say, well, what is your opinion on this? And where is the problem? What is your biggest difficulty with using this drug in that situation will be very personal. And rather than accept, rather than consider we're trying to move everyone up in the volume of knowledge, what we are challenging them to is interact with the knowledge, the discussion, so that they can improve their knowledge. So that uh, Robin and Benedicte have different opinions, different experience, different thoughts, but they can engage with perhaps a reason why they wouldn't use this drug and have different reasons about why they might or might not do it. And that's engagement, which we'll come back to in the further part of the talk, which is different than rather than simply delivering information, which is boring and we have no point or comment on, and it just overwhelms us. But Cecilia, it's a difficult challenge. And that's why, as someone pointed out before, we have to put more effort in to preparing such a talk rather than just listing the 22 side effects of a drug that you're going to give. Any other questions about the message? Uh, in the chat, or open the microphone and speak. It's not a problem to me. Okay, I'm sure there are questions. I'm very happy to answer any of these questions individually through Twitter or through my email, if that would be helpful for you, or to do more talks or discussions. But the point of good learning is that you want to learn more, that you have more questions. And so it cannot be encapsulated just in this little screen in front of me in a short period of time, but that you're going... Uh, ooh, I need to read up on this and come back to it later. That's where learning happens, usually outside of the presentation, stimulated by the discussion that we've had. So let's move on to the second part. Presentation two is the supportive media. So what I'd like you to write down is how would you like to see presentation supportive media improve? And I will come to Katrin Uert, and Henrika for your opinions in one minute. So these three need to be prepared because I'm going to come to them. You can write it down or whatever, but write down for yourself in front of you that makes you think differently. How would you like to see supportive media improved? I'll come in one minute and try and remember those three names, Katrin, Henrika and Ewart.
Okay. So, Katrine, are you able to offer us something about how you think presentation supportive media might be improved? Uh, I think it uh, needs to be congruent with the message. So having a, if you're using a picture, then it's a big picture like the ones you use that are captivating, but they're in tune with what you're trying to convey. So it's not just because it's a nice picture or funny. And not yeah. just a small picture on the side of a lot of text. Or alternatively, having something that is, uh, say, demonstrating how to put on a tourniquet, then you have the tourniquet and you demonstrate by putting it on, or even better, get someone else doing it. But it's the media that is there for the, the purpose of the, um, the talk. Okay, very useful. Ewart, are you able to share something with us? Nothing from Europe. Henrika. Okay, so it's hard sometimes to get these messages up, but let me go on with my supportive media. How can we improve online presentations? And we're talking about the supportive media. Um, the most obvious thing for supportive media improvements is that for the vast majority of presentations we see, they are annotations. People have written stuff down. And in line with uh, that previous comment, I think a really good way to improve presentations is to illustrate our message. The difference from annotation, which is the use of script to support, to the use of image to support. Now, it's important that we recognize this change, that for many people, their presentation, PowerPoint or whatever you want to do, is in fact their presentation. So they'll say, Ross, I'm terribly sorry I missed your meeting. Could you send me the PowerPoint? No. A because there's more to my presentation than simply my PowerPoint, and B, because it only supports what I've got to say. And you are unlikely to get the message simply from a picture of Morpheus and Nia. So the place of starting is that what most people consider the supportive media they have seen is text, and an awful lot of text. And what I would encourage you is that there should be nothing in a presentation that is in a document. Nothing. Facts, yes, but not anything taken directly from a journal article or, heaven forbid, a picture of the journal article itself. Seriously, that's just madness. But it should be something for this medium because this is a different medium. We have got to stop with the use of texts as a document, as a handout, rammed together and read out to the audience, which we call a slidument, but move on to something that supports our message. Now, here's the thing. Why do you have an iPhone? With the exception of Robin, because I know he has very strong opinions on this, vast majority of us have an iPhone because of this, that design matters. And design in supportive media matters. It matters a lot. And whilst you may not recognize that the font you have used makes you look like an idiot, it does if it's Comic Sans, because it was designed to make you look like a comic. Now, if you're a comic talking about rapid sequence induction, then please, you have missed your mission in life, but recognize that design matters. So we have got to stop using text to illustrate the difference between heart attack and heart failure. That is of the virtual reality. And understand that in the matrix, there is a better way of doing that. And what I suggest is that we illustrate the difference between heart attack and heart failure. Now that can be very difficult. And the point that was made earlier is that we have to make our message congruent both in the image and in what we say. But if we have this man considering the difference between heart attack or acute myocardial infarction or STEMI or whatever you want to call it and heart failure, 
in that pause, you now have seen a patient in your mind's eye. You may have seen the swollen ankles, the breathlessness, or you may have seen the patient with the classic signs of chest pain. And that is more illustrative than those lists of facts. So we need to change that. I am disappointed that many people believe that I say we should just put up pretty pictures. And actually, that's not true. If we consider the expected recruitment challenges of recruiting women to a trial of HIV therapy that they have received due to sexual abuse, and you simply put up this woman's picture, you may start to understand that it's difficult, but simply adding the word recruitment gives purpose to that uh, image in a way that the image itself did not have. Text has value, but we have to recognize that bullet points and the massive use of text is counterintuitive and inhibitory to learning. So, um, if I, Benjamin, are you there? Can I ask you, what do you feel are the problems with data slides in the vast majority of presentations that you see? Well, uh, first of all, they're normally presented uh, very briefly and um, you do not have the time to comprehend what's on the slide before the speaker moves on to the next slide, which okay. is really annoying. So you have to choose between the slide and the speaker. Okay, so something like this, which is taken from the CRASH-2 trial. I'm assuming people can see this. Yep, taken from the yes, CRASH-2. Yes. yes, yes, thank you, good. Paranoia is a great thing. Um, if I wanted you to focus purely on vascular occlusive events, what some people would do is put a red box around it. What I can guarantee you is that the vast majority of you are now looking outside of the red box. So that this is a hugely complex data image taken, as I would su suggest incorrectly, from a journal article. And it is almost impossible to focus on that if I want you only to deal with vascular occlusive events. So what I would challenge you is that we should make data slides clear so that the one piece of data that I want you to focus on, because even now some of you are reading outside of the box, is clear to the audience. So that data should be clear. Now let me be clear about this. That is not about hiding data from people, but if I want you only to consider the risk of vascular occlusive events in the CRASH-2 trial using tranexamic acid, comparing it to a placebo, I believe within three seconds, you will understand the implication of this slide. What is the risk of vascular occlusive events in the CRASH-2 trial? There is no increased risk. Now that is key. It's not about cheating. It's not about advertising. It's not about hiding things, but merely making it clear to the audience by the use of image and text and construction of the image that the risk of vascular occlusive events is shown to have no increased risk by comparing those two groups. Now that is a key point that we are discussing. And if I then wanted to go on and talk about the risk of death or the risk of bleeding or the risk to patients with previously existing cardiovascular disease, I can then do that. But by simply showing you that one complex data slide, we are all distracted by the extra data that is available. And this is key. Fewer is more. Now, it's a complexity of English grammar I appreciate, but what we usually try and do is show far too much information. Cover all of those 20 uh, lines in that data slide or allow the audience to get distracted by their favorite ones when, in fact, in the persuasion of bringing them to a point, there is value in that other information, but we should focus the audience more on what is going on. Are there any questions about that initial short summary on considering the supportive media? 
either raise a hand or open your microphone. Eve, I've seen your comment on aims and objectives. I will come back to that at the end. Well, here's one, Marlene. Okay, so uh, is that Katrine? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'll go then to Marlon's written a comment, a question. I find it difficult to find relevant medical pictures obeying copyrights. It's often expensive to use image libraries. Do you have suggestions on where to access good images? Marlon, I do. So the first thing I will put into the chat is my website, which is at foliate.com. Or an easy way to find it is to, uh, whoops, oh, three, that's... Hashtag HTDAP. If you put hashtag HTDAP into Google, it will take you directly to my website. And there is a specific answer and links to images that are available for us. Um, on that, what I would also point out is that actually, sometimes we end up looking for images that we don't need to find images for. If I was to talk to anesthetists about intubation, I do not need a picture of the laryngoscope because I am strongly expecting that Gunnar and Benjamin and Cassandra and Meta and Gustav have all seen a laryngoscope before. And there's often this patronizing and simplistic view of what we need an image for to support what we're saying. If you're talking about intubation, actually me sitting here talking to you is possibly a lot more valuable than a laryngoscope. When somebody may go, oh, that's a Mac Macintosh or a McGill or the bulb is in the wrong place or whatever. When it's not actually valuable and recognize that your audience are adults and they don't need a picture of a laryngoscope simply for you to talk about it. And so there is value in having a slightly oblique view because those oblique points about intubation, which might be a stop sign because it's very difficult. It might be uh, a, a pulse oximetry that reads 84%. Those give thoughts to the audience whilst you're talking about difficult intubation, which will lead them along. So Marlene, what I would suggest is that there are lots of valuable images out there. There are lots of sites that provide them, and there are lots of ways of finding them free. My website will give you a link to that, but don't feel that you need to have a picture of tranexamic acid simply to talk about tranexamic acid, because Benedicte knows what tranexamic acid is without having a picture of that. Any other questions? Uh, Three raised hands. Right. Yes, oh, I can see them. That's great. Katrine. Yes. So I'm wondering then if you have any suggestions on how to be able to um, organize courses that are then for different people. So um, I'm currently trying to organize tra uh, trainings that are for people across the world, but I want to have the same message. Mm. So it's the same principle as say AHLS courses, ATLS, et cetera, these kind of things. It's basically, there's a message. I want to get it across to as many people as possible. It will be delivered by trainers everywhere. And the easiest way that I see how to standardize something is by PowerPoint slides with information, because then you know this is coming across, but do you have any suggestions on how to do that otherwise for the material that cannot be in the form of skill stations and simulations? I think it's a big challenge, and the so-called alphabet courses like APLS, BLS, uh, MOE, or whatever, there are standardized slide sets. It is a misunderstanding to think that simply because the information is in a box that it has been delivered and that we can use those, give them to the presenters and say, this is what I would like you to teach. Can you find something to support that? So that uh, rather than a picture of per Christian's anesthetic room in Stavanger, you might have someone who's working in West Africa who doesn't have an anesthetic room. And so it doesn't confuse them, but they understand anesthetic. They may not have a pulse oximeter, but they can understand understand feeling for the pulse so that those can be relevant for those people. But actually, as I'm showing you now, mostly what we need to encourage people is you don't need slides. 
a, a perfect example of that is I say to people, what was the best presentation you've ever seen? And they usually say it was when the professor turned up, she couldn't get her slides to work, so she just spoke. And she shared her wisdom and insights. And it's not the slides that you think are necessary. It's actually the passion, the stories, and the pictures in our head of the difference between heart attack and heart failure. Now, that is difficult on prescribed courses, but with respect, I suggest those people who are delivering those courses are already experts. And what you often find is that those bullet points act as an anchor to them rather than as a sail to their boat. Jose Gabriel. I think I was the last in line, but, but I'll, I'll ask my question now. Um, how has your view changed on, uh, on presentations in the new Zoom world uh, about supporting media? I think it's very difficult and that's a good question. There are some a blog posts on my website that may help with that. But as you can see, I'm supposedly an expert on this and even I find it a challenge. What I think is disastrous is when you as a presenter become relegated to a tiny little dot in the bottom of your slides. So take control of that. Turn off the slide share and speak to the green dot on your microphone and people will get more from that and realize that most online presentations make most presentations worse. And so complexities of images are made even worse because people, if they get bored of looking at the great wave, will look outside it and start to look elsewhere and get distracted. Ib, I hope that helps, Josie. Uh, just a comment to these uh, the, 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 these pictures that you use. I think the the reason why I find it's hard uh, to 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 condense the information uh, like you did, like this big uh, clip up of the of the journal to just a picture, is that I probably don't do a good work beforehand and be agree with myself what the message is going uh -huh. to be and what is my what is the point with the lecture, what is the take home message, and uh, yeah. That's that's when I don't do this correctly, then I struggle with the rest too. Thank you for that. That's very helpful to go back to, first of all, your confusion about aims and objectives. And also that when we present, when we set up a presentation, we don't need to concentrate on the data, but on a single message. So if all I want you to do is to change a presentation style, I don't feel I have to show you how to do it but I want Joanna, the next time she comes to do a lecture, just to sit there and go, you know what, I am going to do this differently and then be herself rather than Microsoft Blue Wave Times New Roman bullet point list. Okay, there is clearly more that we can do on that. I need to move on. The third part of presentations is how we deliver it, either online or in life. Once again, one minute, how would you like to see presentations improve. I'm going to come to Cecilia. Robin is here if he's able to, and Mette. One minute, I'll be back. Okay, I'm hoping you can see an image of the Arc de Triomphe. My strong suggestion for changing our delivery, the third presentation, is to stop reading things to people and understand that this is a performance. 
Now, it's a good challenge. The next time you're listening to uh, a radio news program, hear the difference between something that is being read out to you, even with passion, and someone who's speaking to you, someone who's sharing emotion, someone who is trying to persuade you to change the way you present. Because what we need to recognize is that we get bored very quickly of someone reading stories to us unless we're a five-year-old. And as adults, the delivery of a presentation changes things. Cecilia, what thoughts did you have? On how to deliver the message. How to improve the delivery, yes. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, the line of thought is clear, uh, easy to follow. And I... I totally agree with you that if I can share a bit of a story that's dear to me, that applies yep. to me, that comes from my experience, that's that that's a moment when I can see the audience listen and, and, and pay more attention. And and another comment on Zoom, it's it's really makes things a lot harder, at least to me, uh, to to uh, to do that uh, because I, I don't get any in contact really with the audience. Exactly, that visual feedback is a problem. Meta, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, that's good. Okay, I have written down that you have to be calm in your presentation, uh, rehearse it, uh, practice it. Okay, uh, so that's for... good. What do you mean calm? Um, is this a Scandinavian, there's nothing in going to upset me, come or...? If, if you're speaking too fast, uh, if you're okay. w walking around, uh, if you have, if, if you want your message to come through, you really need some calmness. You, you know your stuff. Yeah. And let the audience feel that. And, okay. and um, another thing I wrote down is that you have to recognize that you said it earlier, the audience you have knows some things. They come to listen because they know something and they are curious. So, so acknowledge, acknowledge that. Okay, um, good. Now, with one other person I asked, I can't remember now, was it Robin? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Hi. Hello, Russ. Hi. One way to improve delivery, my friend. Uh, one of my pet hates is uh, Microsoft Teams. You uh, mentioned <laughs> it before. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't. Yeah. Um, the way it, the default there is putting you in a thumbnail in the one side and throw, pushing up the, the slides to, uh, for all the reasons that you've been talking about. So uh, in any context where I have any influence, I'm, I'm trying to get people over to Zoom. Uh, because of the simple detail that you can, when we begin, ask the audience, start gallery side by side view, and then put it 50-50. That I feel that if I'm being asked to hold a presentation, I should have some, uh, I should let, be like the producer of, what I, uh, of my material. Uh, and that's my, uh, my privilege, that I can ask that of people. So they can, and that gives at least 50-50 between my face and that, and the material. Yeah, look at my face. I'm doing the dishes here. Uh, but uh, so, yeah. Uh, okay, then that's good. Thank you for that. So what I would encourage uh, presenters is that if you, I hope you can see my slide share. If P3 is zero, then your message will fail. And we must recognize the impact of how we deliver our message and its supportive media will affect its receipt. So it's clear that there needs to be more than simply reading things out. Various helpful comments, as various people have already made, we need practice, that's the multiple golf balls, but we also need a coach. Someone to feedback, someone to encourage, someone to show us, because particularly with the new media that we're having to use, there is more to it than simply turning up one minute or five minutes late because you're struggling with the Wi-Fi. And that is horrendous as a presenter, having that stress added to you when you're still trying to deliver. And we need to be cognizant of that as organizers of meetings, that it's best if we can take that stress away from the poor presenter who's about to deliver. Practice and support 
it cannot be last minute that you discover that your slides are in the wrong format or that your font has disappeared or that the video doesn't play. And the responsibility is of the presenter. Most of us have been to conferences where we've turned up with a USB stick that when the conference organizer plugs it in, it doesn't work. And what we need is time beforehand, not just one minute and a few seconds, but time to make the difference. Now, in the online milieu, we have got to recognize that things need to be different than the forehead shot of the back of my office or staring up my nostrils because it is not a present sight. And that ideally, my best advice is that we should be, I hope that this is what you're seeing now, that we should be in the upper third of our image, that our image should not be centralized on those line of thirds and that ideally you should be well lit, because if you're not, and in the dark, things are very difficult. This is the setup that if you could see, that is actually what you were seeing. With lights and microphones and uh, supportive media, that makes it easier to deliver a better presentation. And that ultimately we need better feedback on improving than simply Thank you for your excellent presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Because trust me, they say that to everyone, however good or bad they are. And that is not feedback. It is a skill that each of us needs to work on to improve. We can use eye contact. We can use drama. And we can use pauses to persuade people that there has to be more than delivery of a presentation, a simply recitation of the notes that I have got here. So two, quest two minutes for one or two questions from anyone on delivery. Either raise your hand or open the microphone and talk. Do we need, just a second, uh, video here. Do, do we need PowerPoint? No. Next. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I've seen people turn up and say, I can't give my, I can't give my presentation because I've left my PowerPoint behind. Sadly, what that means is that they are using their PowerPoint as a script and as a handout. And Robin's going to be upset. I realize the lights have changed. Um, a script and a handout and something for the audience to read. And that's a terrible way to go. Whoa. We need more to it than just I, I, I feel this, this problem that people ask you, can I have your, have your lectures or can I have your PowerPoint after the lecture? And my university actually gave me a, a smack on the fingers because I did not want to give my lecture, my, my, my pictures in the PowerPoint to the students um, because I, I have to. Okay, That's, uh, what, what they're asking for is a, is a handout. What we have got into the habit of doing is making them all the same thing. So if you want to have a handout on the CRASH-2 trial, you can have a handout that gives them the PDF of the paper. You can have your discussion. You can have a video of Karim Brohi explaining why he thinks it's a brilliant thing. And you can have a video of someone discussing it with him. And that's an amazing handout rather than bullet point lists of CRASH-2 and its complications. So why not make a handout an amazing thing that people will actually want to read from? Per Christian, go. I... I had, uh, well, by accident, I think, um, uh, quite uh, success with uh, one of my former totally death by bullet point presentations. I just copied uh, the whole thing from the PowerPoint and made a new kind of ha handout. It was all the points. And, and then I left no words at all in the, uh, in, in, in the PowerPoint presentation, but only used them for 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 cases so i was giving the the some cases for the traumatology students to 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 see and then discuss but i also told them don't bother show up in my uh, lecture if you haven't read the six pages uh, handout <laughs> adult learners always a problem isn't it <laughs> but, but the, the, they actually they they still like it 
Good. And, 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 and the trick then was to just take all your words from the PowerPoint presentations and put them directly into a, a Word document. And voila. Exactly. I mean, I think part of our problem in the past is that we have tried to make our slide set the perfect handout and the perfect script. And then we end up having no point for our delivery. There's no value in it. So if we want the perfect slides, perfect handout, then make it as a separate thing which can be taken away or ideally for adult learners read before so that then Katrine can come and say, I have a question. I've read this and this is what you said, but now here's my thought. And then the learning is more valuable. Any other questions on delivery? One last question on delivery, raise your hand or just type it into the, uh, the chat. Thank you, Cecilia, for your answer. Okay, so summary. My point at the very beginning is that our presentations fail not because we don't care and not because we don't put effort in as the presenter, educator, or the audience, those of us learning, but because of science. And what we need to recognize is that the science is there to support better education. What I strongly suggest, and this is my opinion, but filtered through educational and psychological research, is that we should stop giving out the what of data, but give the so what. We should persuade our specific audience about our message. Our supportive media needs to stop being text, we can give them that as a handout, but something illustrative, something that adds to our message. Mine, the, the matrix, this concept that it's a virtual reality. And our delivery needs to be persuasive, something more than just a reading, because our audience will engage with us and listen and disagree or agree be persuaded or otherwise, but at least they have an opinion. The meme that I've used of the matrix, and that's why you've seen the green imagery and over the two, is that in the matrix, Morpheus offers Neo a choice. He says to him, the world is not as you perceive it. And I'm hoping that my friends, you understand that the world of presentations as it currently exists is a virtual reality. And what Morpheus says to Neo is you have to make a choice. Take the blue pill and go on believing the world is as you've seen it, that reading out PowerPoint or sat there listening to it is in some way education. I won't be there. My hope is that you have taken the red pill, the alternative, and that you are starting to see that the world is very, very different. I can help you. I can share with you direction and insight and ideas so that you can start to live your real life and by your education and being educated, change the world around you. Because I firmly believe that education saves more lives than I will do as an individual. And that is why I have the passion for what I do. Susan Tack, my friends, my colleagues, for all your attention and for the opportunity to share with you.